This conference will now be recorded. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers from North Sunflower Medical Center in Ruleville, Mississippi. Sam Miller, Chief Executive Officer, Rodney Clark, Chief Operations Officer, and Joni Perkins, Chief Compliance Officer. Sam Miller started his health care career as a paramedic firefighter in Birmingham, Alabama. While in Alabama, Sam completed a degree in accounting and a master's degree in nursing from Delta State University as a family nurse practitioner. Mr. Miller came to North Sunflower Medical Center in 2001 as the administrator of the long-term care unit and has worked as an emergency room nurse, risk manager, safety officer, quality improvement director. In 2005, he was promoted to the position of chief operating officer and in 2015 promoted to chief executive officer. Sam maintains a strong emphasis on new technology, access to care, quality initiatives, and education. Rodney Clark had a 25-year career in the banking industry prior to joining North Sunflower Medical Center as chief operations officer in 2015. He has served on numerous local and regional boards and is currently serving as Executive Director of the North Sunflower Medical Center Foundation Board, President of the Ruleville Chamber of Commerce Board, and President of the Ruleville Economic Development Council Board. Throughout his life, he has worked to help his Mississippi Delta community, and he looks forward to continuing that service. Joni Perkins, North Sunflower Medical Center's Chief Compliance Officer, has worked in healthcare management for 37 years. Her focus for the past 20 years has been specializing in rural health clinics and critical access hospitals. 30 years ago, she began her own consulting business specializing in outpatient billing and clinic startups. As the need for rural consulting grew, she divided the business and is now the principal consultant, working with clinics and critical access hospitals nationwide. Ms. Perkins has a special love for the Delta region and moved to the great state of Mississippi in 2007. She serves rural areas by sitting on the National Rural Health Association Congress, the Primary Care HRSA Committee, and the CMS Rural Focus Committee. Today's call will be moderated by Terry Hill, Rural Health Innovations Executive Director. Terry, are you on the phone line? I am, Kim. Great. I'm going to turn it over to you and our speakers from North Sunflower Medical Center. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, this is somewhat different. We've been holding these performance management group calls for years, but uh, very often it's, we're prim primarily looking at the small rural hospital transition project that might have been conducted in a particular hospital uh, and really talking about that entire um, process itself and what we learned and uh, those, those have been really pretty exciting calls. We've seen just great leadership uh, demonstrated by our rural hospital leaders. Uh, we've seen a lot of progress being made, et cetera. But today we thought we'd really focus it in just on one issue uh, that um, we really want to take a look at, which is on chronic illness management. Uh, as most of you know, uh, chronic illness management is a huge part of the success formula for value-based uh, models, whether they're accountable care organizations or the state demonstration projects, et cetera. Uh, chronic illness management becomes a key to improving the health of our population and we think also in terms, it, it becomes a key part of the formula for financial success and quality success in the future. So we're going to take a look at, at one hospital's experience. Um, oftentimes what we, we hear, well, you know, if, if we were in Minnesota, we'd be able to do this as well because your payment, your Medicaid payment is better or your um, Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance payment is better, et cetera. Uh, I can just tell you from experience here, um, Mississippi has as many challenges as virtually any other state in the country in terms of its payment. And still, we, we get examples of 
just outstanding hospitals doing good work and having time and energy to really look at population health and uh, chronic illness management. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn things over to our team from North Sunflower Medical Center. And they're going to tell you a little bit about this project. And then we're, we're going to come back. And I'm going to have some questions for them. And we'll have a conasation afterwards. Team, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Terry, this is Sam Miller, uh, CEO. And I want to thank you guys for having us. Um, we're, we're very glad to be a part of this and uh, uh, share some of the stuff we've learned over the last few years. Um, this project actually uh, that we're going to speak of today, chronic disease management for the hospital really started with kind of the hospital turnaround uh, in 2005. Local entrepreneur uh, made that possible by, by really uh, talking to us about thinking out of the box. And we didn't have a lot of choice, actually. Uh, Mr. Billy Marlowe uh, was the architect of our turnaround. The, the turnaround included uh, an increased access to care, and which brings me to really where chronic disease management started for us was by expanding uh, our rural health clinic. And so for the last nine to ten years, we, we increased that access by, by moving it, uh, also by increasing the hours of open. 16 hours a day, uh, every day except Christmas. Uh, and, and in that, naturally, uh, being in the Mississippi Delta, uh, brought quite a bit of chronic disease, hypertension, diabetes, it, it's, it's rampant. And our part was by increasing access to care with primary care providers, namely the additional physicians and nurse practitioners, we we were treating that, that population. So as the years um, went on, in doing that, some formal programs uh, came our way. Uh, and we kind of, they kind of adopted us. I mean, we're sitting in, a, in an optimum place to, to talk about uh, population health disease management. So in that, this particular project came our way. Uh, really, we've had a long collaboration uh, with the University of Mississippi Medical Center. They uh, have, a, have a broad interest in community-related projects, and of course, uh, chronic disease management. They came into the Delta, asked us, and we've always, we've always had a feeling that in projects like this, we wanted to be a part of this stuff, and uh, because obviously we're in the right spot to do so, we, uh, we signed on, on board with this. And uh, as you can see, uh, several other providers, including uh, the state, uh, General Electric, C Spire, our, our, which is our uh, cell phone provider, uh, signed on to this. And the idea was to, to find out how technology could increase or help uh, chronic disease management. Diabetes was the chosen um, disease. But in that, uh, we still maintain our presence as a 25-bed critical access hospital. Uh, we have expanded our uh, our footprint quite a bit uh, by outpatient services. But uh, this project, uh, when when asked to be a part of it, we we jumped on that, and, and we uh, we've uh, it started kind of jump started uh, our uh, our population health project. This project. This is Joni Perkins speaking now, and. Um, University of Mississippi Medical Center came to us and asked us about uh, part, being a participant in this. The goal was to get both North and South Sunflower Hospital districts involved. Unfortunately, South Sunflower had some turnover and weren't able to participate, so it, it kind of fell on our shoulders, and we were glad to take it on. Um, the, they had a steering committee, and we divided up into five subcommittees to start the project off, one of which was finance. I, I sat on that committee. We looked at estimated total cost of the project to be about $1.4 million. Um, we had a statistical committee who takes our raw data and makes sense out of it and publishes it, um, just the white paper. A clinical committee who, to develop the algorithms for how our patients were going to be treated through this. Information technology had to have them. We were using broadband services. 
uh, from uh, 30, 40 miles distance from the clinic. Uh, some of the people didn't have the greatest connectivity, and that was a bit of a struggle for us, but we got there. Um, we had a public relations committee because the governor was a big part of launching this project. He, uh, Mississippi leads, is one of the leading states in the nation for telemedicine, and the governor was very excited about doing telemedicine for population health in the heart of the Deep South. So um, he got on board, so we had a whole public relations department. Um, the project started off and we got quite a bit of excitement from the Federal Communications Commission and the director of that commission flew down. The governor was here. We got uh, Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It wasn't Mississippi, it was PBS, came down from New York and shot film here and did a story called The Quiet Revolution. If you want to see it, North Sunflower's piece on this diabetes program is in there. So we got started off with a bang. Um, the picture, if you're able to see your slides, the next picture I'm showing you is Governor Bryant uh, with Christy Henderson. She is another fellow nurse practitioner and good friend of Sam's, explaining the program and showing the governor the Diabetes Telehealth Center and what it took to launch it, um, the project. So the committees worked slow as oftentimes university committees too, and I was anxious to get started. Um, so we got a we got a kickoff to the project from the governor and then began. And I'm going to let Sam tell you a little bit about our hospital and then Rodney tell you a little bit about our town, only to do this part because we think if we can do it, certainly anybody can. Oh, thank you, John. We uh, going back over uh, we, we are a, a critical access bed, a critical access hospital. We have 25 beds. We do have a distinct part uh, general psych unit, 10 beds. We have a long-term care unit uh, that's adjacent to the hospital, which is 60 beds. And then when it comes to uh, one, of our, one of our growing uh, services is the rural health clinic, which is uh, adjacent from the picture you see in the hospital or within our, on our campus. Uh, we have uh, four uh, physicians or four providers that are doing the day. In the evening, uh, we have uh, a minimum of two providers. Uh, in that population of patients that, that we serve, there were several hundred diabetics that, that are being treated with primary care uh, from the rural health clinic. And it, it, it allows us uh, kind of a, a great access point. Uh, to being able to treat the, these patients. It also, in that, and in our hospital, we've always been really strong on technology. So we actually had to work with uh, engineers from uh, one of the local providers to try to make sure that we had enough uh, broadband to, to do some of this. And so all of that was part of the project. But North Sunflower today, uh, we have an outpatient, uh, a large outpatient program uh, we try to expand those services as we're asked, usually by the patients uh, and the physicians, and we'll maintain that. Chronic disease management naturally fits into that, that scenario. This is Rodney, the CEO. I was going to tell you a little bit about Ruble and kind of what Terry said about some of the challenges that Mississippi faces, and particularly us. We're, we're located in Sunflower County. It's in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. And our town consists of about 3,200 uh, population. Of, of the county population uh, of residents 25 years and older, uh, only 59% have a high school education or high school graduates. Our median household income is approximately $25,000, and our per capita income is approximately $11,500. Uh, if you compare this to our state, uh, state levels are approximately 31,000 for the median and 16,000 for the per capita. Uh, all that translates to a uh, about a third percent of the Sunflower County residents live below the poverty level. So you, you can see from that that we're one of the poorest counties and one of the poorest states. Uh, but it's not all gloom and doom because of North Sunflower, the town 
has had a revitalization that's really turned around, and we are one of the thriving towns in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and all that's because the hospital led the, led the charge, and the town got behind it, and uh, just turned it around. Because of that, we consider ourselves the healthcare hub of the Delta, and what a perfect fit for us with with the uh, poor stats, the, the poor poverty level, and all that to curtail it into the healthcare hub of the Delta to kick off and get behind this diabetes initiative. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, Sam, again, I wanted to kind of do a uh, going back to the telehealth. Uh, um, initiative and give kind of the broad goals. Uh, in doing that, and I want to say this because it, it, uh, it's a daily saying among us, when uh, Rodney mentioned the health care hub of, of the Delta, uh, my favorite saying with us is that our mission is strong, and it remains that way. We take that very seriously, and that's one of the reasons why we try to uh, be a part of these projects. On the diabetes, diabetes initiative goals, uh, the goals were kind of broad and they uh, we developed them over many, many meetings. Uh, some of those were here uh, at our facility, some were at university. It was amazing at the uh, participants uh, that were there, and it was really interesting to get to work with those people. But the overall goal was to improve the health of diabetics by bringing multiple health care resources to our community through the use of technology, primarily telehealth or some form of tele telemedicine that, that developed originally into our finally developed into tablet technology, which was very, very interesting in how we accomplished that. But the Mississippi Diabetes Telehealth Network uh, initially focused on one of the biggest challenges that we see uh, all the time, diabetes. The uh, well, Mississippi, as a state, uh, one of those things that, we're, uh, that we work on all the time is that we're one of the top two highest uh, states in the nation for the prevalence of, of diabetes. The, the goal of that was to, was to slow down, stop, get a handle on, and try to improve compliance, which has always been a problem, uh, and to try to cut that down. And how do you do that? Several people from university that were diabetes specialists uh, worked on that and helped us to develop this program. And the idea was, to simply slow down, try to increase compliance. The, the, uh, we used a remote care management platform uh, where the patients would have continuous access uh, to the program or to the diabetes specialist or any of the team specialists. Uh, one of those components for us was we had a full-time uh, RN developed to this program. We had a uh, we had a registered dietitian. We had a pharmacist uh, that helped participate through uh, university, a pharm D. And all of the program, all the components of the program were designed where they would have full-time, easy, and ready access. That proved to be a success part of the program, and it did increase compliance. The overall goal, we sat down and said, okay, what one thing do you want to measure? Well, naturally, on uh, diabetics, we, we picked hemoglobin A1Cs, and the idea was to have a one point or greater reduction in hemoglobin A1Cs for 75% of that population. So how did we do it? How did we come up with our population? We had a, we, we identified, we had a population focus of up to 200 patients. Uh, these patients were selected or pre-identified by our our North Sunflower uh, primary care physicians that had two or more visits within the last 12 months. They had to be over 18 years of age and a hemoglobin A1C of over 7%. Once these patients were identified, our care coordinator would call them to educate and assist them for their enrollment in the program. Uh, these patients were verbally consented and they were scheduled for an enrollment visit what we called an enrollment visit. And then the PCP of these patients were notified and baseline labs were pre-ordered before their enrollment visit. Once they came for the enrollment visits, we obtained the patient's consent, commitment to be an active participant, psych evaluations, 
tools were used to evaluate the expected engagement and ability. And then the initial visit was scheduled for seven to ten days later where the retinopathy screening was scheduled. And from that point, this is the algorithm we use for the project. Um, the clinical committee team put this together. We followed, uh, at the time, there were 2015 ADA standards for diabetic patients. So this is the algorithm our folks followed. I know it's a busy slide. There's lots on there. Uh, but it's how we did it. One of the things that was unique, one of the things that was unique about the program were the clinical team weekly calls. So the patient was the center of the clinical team. And when we had a patient that was struggling, we just couldn't get our blood, their blood sugars down or, or something was happening with them or we had a common problem, like one of our common problems was those Bayer glucometers that we were using for people to upload their blood sugars to us every day. Um, they, Bayer discontinued that particular brand of glucometer, so it was a little difficult to get test strips for our patients. But during our weekly calls, we discussed that, we broke down barriers, we, we figured out what we needed to do to keep our patients moving on the right track, and that was very interesting. So the, the project is a year long. We enrolled patients for one year, and so the project, the entire project time was two years long. So we started enrolling patients, and these are the baseline lab tests that we did. Of course, the A1C, a cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, BUN, creatinine, potassium, GFRs, and albumin. These were agreed on by the entire clinical team, and every patient who enrolled in the study got this um, pre-study baseline test done. At that point in time, we decided to do monofilament foot exams and document their process throughout the screening, or throughout the year-long project with each patient. Um, we also wanted to know what they knew about diabetes. We ran into some people who really didn't know very much at all about their disease. We received a diabetic uh, retinopathy camera several years before it was a Delta Health Alliance grant, and we were able to put that back into action and send our images um, to UMMC for the ophthalmologist there to read and send us the report. Um, we were able to um, refer our patients in the study to an endocrinologist. We have a telehealth room in the rural health clinic where they would meet up with the endocrinologist. And we had uh, pharmacists available for our patients to meet with. And the dietitian was North Sunflowers. Now, when I told you in the beginning that uh, the budget for this um, particular project, no money changed hands by any partners. This was all in-kind donors from each of the fa um, facilities that partnered in this grant. We all had a partnership. North Sunflower hired the dietitian. North Sunflower had the uh, registered nurse who was the coordinator of all this project. UMMC supplied the pharmacist, the endocrinologist. So everybody had pieces in it. GE supplied care innovations. GE also supplied the tablets that we handed out to the patients. We had all our patients set self-management goals. We all know how important those are for diabetes. And we had to get them trained on the tablets that we were giving them. So the goal was to use the uh, software Care Innovations to talk to our patients every day, remind them to upload their blood sugars to us every day from the tablet, and they have an education session each and every day of the year-long project. If you didn't open your tablet, it would send you a little reminder. It would ding. It would, it would get you to open the tablet up. Um, we could see the patient's blood sugars on a daily basis. Those results went straight into UMMC to their telehealth kind of home central office. Uh, we had nurse practitioners, one on their end, one on our end, um, who were looking at those and talking to our patients when we saw um, not great results. So instructing them on the tablets, uh, we thought that was was going to be a big deal, but actually they people did pretty good. Even people who hadn't had 
hadn't used them before. So at the end of the first visit, and it was quite a long visit, we worked it down from two hours to about an hour and 15 minutes. We didn't want to beat them up too bad. We scheduled their second visit. So that's when the primary care providers came in. Um, we also had them work with the nutritionists on food assessment. Uh, we had access to a certified diabetic educator at the um, University of Mississippi Medical Center. And the primary care provider made decisions from there on what lab tests needed to be done. We did a lot of follow-up, a lot of reminding patients, scheduled their visit, and kept very, very good track of where they were in this program. If you can imagine enrolling patients for 12 months and then getting patients through each stage of those 12 months, those four visits, there was a lot of care coordination going on. We did basically the same thing at visit three and visit two. Um, we, we let the primary care providers do what they needed to do. We continued doing the monofilament foot exams, documenting our results in our electronic medical record, and scheduling their next appointment. The last appointment we did, obviously, we decommissioned their tablets, we redid their foot assessments, and then repeated all of their labs. So at this point, um, I did have a, um, a YouTube video that I would like to you to take a moment to look at. It's one of our patients who was kind of a cheerleader for the study who was able to, um, to have very, very good results with this, with this program. So that's kind of what we did. And Terry, we're happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the overview. Just fantastic work here. And, and I've also noticed that kind of in the deep south, Louisiana, Mississippi, there's been some really extraordinary telehealth uh, projects. I know there's been emergency room coverage that has been years it's been going on, et cetera. So let me just ask a few questions about this. Um, so what I heard you say, and, and I just want to confirm, is was, was diabetes was, was something that you've identified in your community. It's obviously big in the South. But did you have a pretty good feel for the kind of the depth of your diabetes issues and problems? Terry, this is Joni. And, and we did. We got a good feel for it. Um, the clinic is sort of the place where everybody comes, whether you cut your toe mowing the lawn or you have a chronic disease. So we had a, a, a epidemiologist work with our electronic medical record and um, really go through our data and identify the diabetic patients. And we had so many. Um, it was it was it was phenomenal. We did presentations at local churches and reached out to the community and got quite a few. The, the funny part was we got people from two communities away from our community that wanted to come in and be a part of the project. Well, that's understandable. That's, that's really pretty extraordinary. Um, in terms of what about the board, tell us a little bit about your board because we keep hearing again that very often the board uh, is kind of into the old mode of doing things, et cetera. Did you, did it, was it any problem of convincing your board to participate? No, Terry, this is Sam. Uh, no, it was not. They, we've had a, uh, a very progressive board. Uh, they're, they're, they're a good good group of people. They've always been really open-minded and kind of, when I went back to the turnaround in the hospital and mentioned Mr. Marlowe, uh, uh, the first piece of that was always and literally uh, to kind of go around and say think out of the box. So the board members came on board during that period of time of growth. Uh, uh, they, could, they, could, they were actually wonderful at uh, giving us feedback from the community, uh, church groups, uh, we had a lot, there's a lot of community activity here, and it was fairly uh, easy to tie into that. So we got a lot of feedback, but our board members are, are very active, and they've, they've always been uh, big on uh, 
on they've, they've been great about technology, the use of it, uh, granting us that, and, and supporting us. Going back to the telehealth, uh, it, the first piece of tele, telehealth we actually did was with the university, and we still have it today, is uh, our emergency room. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where, it, where we actually got started with UMC. But, uh, you know, on the question of the board, we were very fortunate. They were behind it from, uh, from the first time we mentioned it. And you know, that's, it, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Sam, because that becomes, we think, a new role for the board itself. It's not just to have oversight in the hospital, it's to help to drive population health and uh, chronic illness uh, management programs, et cetera. So it's good to see that, uh, that they got it. You also mentioned churches, which we think are another real resource here. And we've just seen some extraordinary work that churches have done once they've been engaged by the hospital to help with this stuff. Um, the, another problem uh, we all we hear of frequently is that of the medical staff. And it's just like, you know, our docs are so busy, it'd be a great thing to do to do chronic illness management. But how did you convince your, your physicians to get on board? And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, their role. So, Terry, this is Joni again, and you're exactly right. I was, we were, not everybody saw this with, you know, not everybody jumping up and down and, hey, let's get started like I was. So um, the physicians and the nurse practitioners, because we operate three distinct and separate shifts at the clinic, we have a day shift, a night shift, and a, and a weekend shift, we had to get them all together. And so we did two different presentations. We brought in all the guns from UMM and GE and we showed them the technology we you know we kind of cheerleaded them through it and then when the governor got on board they were like oh okay it, we, we just we pushed and we said we're not taking control out of your hands because I think that's how they perceive evidence-based medicine sometimes but that we are experimenting with this new technology and we we use the technology to forward their cooperation with the project. And it worked. It worked. They all got along. Terrific. Are, are your physicians and providers uh, employed by the hospital, or are they independent? They're all employed. <laughs> that was the easier part. They're all employed. Yeah, and sometimes that's not, not always a slam dunk either. We've heard that. Uh, you know, just because they're employed doesn't mean that they're going to go along with it, obviously. That's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, um, the, one of the things that, that we stress here at uh, RHI in the center is the fact that, you know, the various social determinants of health, uh, diabetes being a really good example. There's so many influences on, on diabetes, outcomes, diet, um, you know, social conditions, et cetera. Uh, it really does kind of require some collaboration, and I heard uh, a bit of that in, in your initial comments about the need for collaboration. Tell us a little bit more about that. Was it hard to get other partners? Uh, you know, kind of what? Give us a little idea of who 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 else might have been involved here. This, we were so lucky with this because it was a brainchild of the folks at UMMC who had started gathering partners and were just looking for a participation partner to actually be a clinic site when, when we got invited to the project. Um, I will tell you that um, we ran into some challenges, but uh, we all would pull back together. We had probably steering committee meetings every quarter, and then we'd do a big meeting probably biannually to get try to get everybody back on the same page and recharged and um, the, the, some of the challenges we ran into was with the tablets. I mean, you dispense 200 tablets using broadband and air cards and that is one of the things I know moving forward. The next time I do a telehealth project, I'm doing it with a smartphone. <laughs> it was 
a lot of <laughs> challenges. But um, the partners were great and stepped up to the plate. They just they stepped up to the plate when we needed them to with our patients because you know you can have a lot of good partners like the ones we did. GE Heavens, you don't get much better than that, and and the the governor uh, being behind it. But these are our patients. These are our patients right here in Ruleville, Mississippi, and um, you know we felt a special bond, of course, with our patients, and we wanted to make things right. So pulling things out of that partnership was important, and everybody rose to the, rose to the call. So the, the tablets were used with the patients, is that correct? The, the patients had the tablets to check in on and to uh, communicate with? That's correct. Every patient was issued a tablet that connected to care innovations, and we had uh, built a diabetes program. We didn't actually build it. Care Innovations had a had a model for us, and we just we just tweaked the model of what patients would see every day about getting their exercise, a proper diet, or being sure to check their blood sugar. It was a, just a kind of a. I got a good analogy. One of the people in the project told me she said it's like driving down the highway having this tablet with you all the time. It's like driving down the highway, the speed limit's 55, nobody in sight, and you're going 70. She said having that tablet is like having the state cops behind you on the highway. You're driving 55. <laughs> good, good picture. Tell me a little bit more. I think this is a really important lesson that you're learning here. But but you just said, Joni, didn't you, that if you were going to do it again, you might go with with just the use of smartphones. Is that correct? And, and talk a little bit more about why you might go in that direction. We had a lot of trouble. The tablets obviously were stored here at North Sunflower because they were dispensed from North Sunflower, and they came in the boxes they were in, and they had to be put together, fit with the air car, they had to be tested before each patient could take one home. And we might go through three or four before we got one to work properly. No slam against GE. They just didn't work very well for us. Um, then you added an air card to that. You've got a Bayer contour glucometer with a cable connecting it to upload blood sugars. It was just technologically, it was, we had probably 25 to 30 percent of our patients who really had some issues. So um, C Spire stepped up and so did GE and they um, put a person in Ruleville to go out to the patient's homes and help them with these connectivity problems. So I just Terrific. think I just think Everybody's got a smartphone, so. so. Terry, uh, Sam, again, I think part of that, you know, the first thing when we had our initial meeting, I think the idea of, of the smartphone, because there were a lot, uh, in going back, uh, there were a lot of smartphones out there, and we thought about that. When it came down to the technology, uh, part of the project, uh, going in was, uh, although it wasn't listed as uh, as one of the ultimate goals, was knowing that we were going to run across those very, very issues and how and can you overcome those in a rural setting. The partners were wonderful uh, in doing that, uh, as Joni mentioned. And, and so part of that learning curve uh, was worked just beautifully as to what will work and won't work, uh, even after this short period of time, uh, if we were to revisit this, we're always thinking about the smartphone uh, being being one of the primary candidates because everybody, well, not everybody, but most people have that and they're carrying a cell phone with them. So I just wanted to kind of mention that uh, we knew going in that we were going to have those problems and getting through them was part of the project. Really, a, a wonderful learning. Yeah, learning that I'm glad we're sharing with with 
other hospitals, other communities, et cetera. This, this is just really important work. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the collaboration. Now, you know, kind of chronic illness has been something that, uh, you know, public health has been dealing with. It, it really hasn't historically been something that, uh, I mean, hospitals tend to get the chronically ill after they've crashed or after their diabetes has gotten so bad that they're in need of hospitalization or acute services, et cetera. Uh, did, did you have, uh, you mentioned, you know, the epidemiologist, which would be, would be really helpful here. What about public health? Was public health a player here? Were they supportive? about that a little bit. Well, the epidemiologists worked with them to draw some numbers. Um, they weren't, the, the health department was not as involved as you might think um, in the project. I wish I could tell you more. Um, Joni, was, was that because you would think they they didn't want to be, or is there some resistance? This is, an, to me, another important issue as well, because public health and hospitals have historically not worked that closely together. And I'm just wondering, if, you know, from your from your perception, was it that they didn't want to participate? They thought you were invading their turf. Uh, they simply didn't know about it. And any thoughts on that? No, we had people coming out of the woodwork to participate in the program. I mean, we had partners coming out of the woodwork. Once the, once the press got out, this was very um, well advertised about this great, you know, new potential. And if you have diabetes and want to become a part of it, there were commercials on television. We had big to-dos. And, um, of course, then when PBS got involved, we had so many people coming at us wanting to be partners that we just left the original partners as they were. Not that public health okay. wasn't invited. They just, when they came in, there were already so many others offering to help. Lots of vendors all over wanted to be a part of this. Terrific. Okay. I, I do, do get what is the one statistic okay. about the program. It's the only thing that's been released because the statisticians still have all of our data. We're waiting for them to chew through it and spit out a great paper. But um, we did not have any hospital readmissions in our two-year period for any of our diabetics. So that, that in itself is a tremendous savings to the state of Mississippi. Wow, that is really impressive. That was going to be my next question. What kind of outcomes have you seen? Um, so, so in terms of readmissions, you had none. That, that's terrific. Yeah, zero. And um, and I and uh, ER admits were for diabetes were zero. Um, but I can't say any more. I, I can tell you that I've looked at the data, but I'm not allowed to say until it's published. Okay. Pretty good. <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit more about the uh, participants. How many? I, I I don't know if you stated how many participants did you have. Our goal was to get 200 patients in our population of focus, and um, we ended up with 183 who completed the program. That that was a a good number because it was a year long program <laughs> and we bother them a lot because we watch huh. their blood sugars you, every day you know <laughs> well that's you know the, when you really look at what has been successful as we've looked at either a public health standpoint etc that constant monitoring is absolutely essential and um, again you know the in, in, in value-based models, uh, you know, 
and, and I, I'm assuming you're not currently participating in a combo care organization or any other value-based model. No, not right. at this moment. Yes, sir, that's correct. Right. So it, in essence, if people say, well, what if I don't have a, a University of Mississippi out there? Uh, in essence, the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the readmission figures is, is huge uh, from a, from a value-based model standpoint. Uh, chronic illness management, the, um, the, 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 you know, the, the cut down on emergency room usage, et cetera. Even though you're not in a value-based model, this has tremendous implications. I just think this stuff is really, really important. Because in essence, um, the the dollars that could be available to help fund a project like this could be found, found in these value-based models. And that doesn't mean people should rush out to get into them, but that as we look to the future, this transitioning into more value, I think we believe that there will be money available to do this sort of thing. It'll be part of the funding formulas, et cetera. And we already see it playing out in value-based models. And there's so many of those out there, state value-based models, uh, accountable care organizations, obviously, Medicaid demonstration projects. Uh, Pennsylvania just went to global payment, which means that they're moving towards all of their payers paying the same prospective payment for, for their work hospitals in Pennsylvania, and we've already seen it pioneered in Maryland as well. So this, this is, is extremely important um, learning and uh, just really a, a phenomenal result. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, you've, you've told us a lot about this project. What what are some of the lessons learned? I mean, what what, what have you learned? Bottom line, if you could going to choose three or four or more of if you want, how could you kind of capitalize them into lessons learned for other rural hospitals? Well, the um, the the biggest thing for for us would be moving to a smartphone. I, we are going to expand now into hypertension and obesity, and then hopefully asthma after that, using smartphone technology. Um, there are companies out there who actually have good products that can be used on your smartphone. Uh, that was a big one. The second one was, you know, we didn't, we didn't plan for the number of people who were would not be able to give us their blood sugar when they when we stopped getting blood sugar results. We would call them and they say, "I'm out of strips. I'm out of strips." They couldn't afford those those strips. So there was more than one time Sam and Rodney, where I came around passing the hat, going, "I need a donation." <laughs> And we did a really, really good deal with our pharmacy here. But even at that, it was enough patients, enough of the time needing strips to be able to participate in the program. Because if you missed so many blood sugars, we weren't allowing you to stay in the program. That um, having that kind of funding set aside up front is it's better to be a known fact than me going around administration passing the hat. Mm -hmm. Any other lessons learned? I, I, you know, kind of. I, I know you've mentioned a few already, but anything else to either warn folks of or say, boy, this was one of the smartest things we did. Uh, I, I can tell you one thing on for me, it was awfully hard to wait to start the program 
for the IRB to get the final approval. Um, I just, we were, everything was ready to go and we needed IRB approval. Now, I know that that's a necessary evil when you want to do a human research project, but that was, that was extremely difficult to me. It delayed the start of our project by probably three and a half to four months. Um, that moving on and expanding chronic disease or sunflower um, will be, we're not partnering with the university in that way. And if, if we do need IRB approval, I, I think you can hire it done. But I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was a good project, but I, I'm a little too impatient to move at that glacial <laughs> <laughs> Which I imagine is, is good. yeah, especially with um, you know the funding funding coming from you know various sources that don't necessarily always operate on your schedule. Right. Are you going to continue this project? Uh, are you going to? I know you. You're getting the results right now, but I'm just wondering, is this going to be something that's going to be a regular service provided um, by the hospital? We would very, very much like to continue this. We have, uh, we're working with some other partners. We applied for a National Institute of Health grant and unfortunately didn't receive that one for just a little under 500000 So we're going to apply again. Um, obviously, hand, doing it ourselves, moving from this beautiful partnership to doing it ourselves, we need to have a funding source. So I'm looking for grant funding to, to expand it into not just diabetes, but cardiovascular disease and then obesity. We're going to just keep taking 